to another edition of the Public Interest. My name is David Granger, and on this series of programs, we deal with matters of public interest um, to Guyanese in the diaspora and at home. And as we approach the month of August, um, the program will be dealing particularly with um, issues affecting the future of Ghana as seen through the eyes of African Guyanese. In my view, um, the number of events that occurred during August historically warrant the designation of August as African Guyanese History Month, not because we're dealing with a specific ethnic group, but because of the impact of the events of August on the rest of Guyanese history, um, really nearly 200 years of Guyanese history. And as you know, this year particularly, we celebrated the 200th anniversary of the Demerara Revolt, which is significant not only for Demerara or Guyana, and the Caribbean for the entire world. Um, today we're dealing with the whole concept of emancipation, um, not as an event. It's not a simple event. It is not a single event. It's not a sudden event. And it, it, it was not of short duration. Emancipation, I regard as a movement. It was not a short act. It was a struggle which took place over a period of over 200 years. And the aim was to destroy the system of slavery. And the movement consisted not only of a single act, but also of resistance, of rebellions, of revolts, of running away, and a marinage over this period of two centuries. And of course, it culminated, in theory at least, on the 1st of August, 1838 when in Guyana alone, over 85,000 Africans were freed, emancipated. And uh, as we said before, from the time of capture, the Africans were in a state of shock. You know, they resisted, some of them mutiny, they committed suicide, they jumped off the ships. When they came to the Guyana plant plantations, some of them ran into the bush, and became Maroons. Some of them revolted and were, were killed. And um, it was a period of intense struggle. Not all of the revolts were, were successful. In fact, very few were successful. Most of them failed. And again, it depends on how you judge success, but we'll come to that. Why did the enslaved Africans revolt in this emancipation movement? What were the causes of the movement? There were four main causes. First was that they themselves rejected enslavement. Um, and as I said, they resisted, they rebelled, they revolted, they ran away, and they set up maroon communities in Ghana. Some Guyanese don't even know that maroon communities existed. But in fact, we did have maroon communities. You know, we know that Suriname, there are maroon communities, which are called Bosnagers, or Bush Negroes, and in Jamaica, there are maroon communities. But there were also maroon communities in Guyana. And um, there were main, four main revolts. The Demara, the Borbis Revolt in 1763, which we, we know. Uh, and there's a monument to commemorate that revolt in, uh, at, uh, in the Square of the Revolution. There was the Demarara Maroon, I call it a Maroon War, which occurred in West Demarara between Breeden Hoop and Bursiri. Many Guyanese don't know about the Demerara Maroon War, but we'll deal with that later. Then there was the, the Demerara Revolt on the East Coast Demerara, which is separate from the Demerara Maroon War. Um, the Demerara Revolt occurred in 1823. And finally, there was an Essequibo Revolt um, based on La Belle Alliance, uh, which the French would call La Belle Alliance, but we say La Belle Alliance in Guyana. But there were four main revolts. And on another occasion, we can look at those revolts and the impact that they had on the future of Guyanese history. But there were many other revolts. In fact, most revolts failed. And I suppose you can say that even these four revolts failed if you look at the, uh, the fact that the rebels were generally executed and punished and tortured. Um, there was you can argue, not a single successful revolt. 
in fact, in, um, has happened in Haiti. But that's another matter. So the first cause of the movement was the rejection of enslavement. The second was that um, economics had started to change. It was the adoption of liberal economic policies, especially in the industrialized state, which themselves were the um, authors of the transatlantic trade in captive Africans. And the new theories led by Adam Smith and others argued that it is better, it is more profitable to buy cheap sugar from other territories than by propping up the unprofitable plantations in the West Indies. And uh, of course, many of the rich planters had built you know, huge mansions in Britain. But this was a time when um, uh, a new class was arising in Britain, a class that was oriented towards profit-making, a commercial class, a mercantile class, a business class, and they weren't interested in buying expensive sugar, when cheaper sugar could have been made available elsewhere. It was an era of capitalism, an era of colonialism, an era of imperialism. Um, these huge empires were being formed, an era of mercantilism, based largely on the profit motive, based largely on manufacturing and commerce, based largely on the fact that the industrial revolution had started to transform production at a rapid rate, based on the fact that the American colonies had gained their independence in 1783, which meant that Britain had to search for new colonies, which was also prompted by the defeat of the French Empire under Napoleon Bonaparte in 1814. Um, so it meant that, the, that Britain did not have rivals on continental Europe. And as a result of all of these changes, Britain started to extend its power, its maritime power. It was a huge mercantile empire, maritime empire, um, extending into East Asia, into the East Indies and, and also into Australia. So it was a time when a new type of economy had taken hold of these northern manufacturing uh, states. You might wonder what all of this has to do with slavery. Well, the fact is that slavery was also was already becoming obsolete, and that sugar production was obsolescent even 200 years ago. So some of the problems we're facing today were well known 200 years ago, and this has been a slow death. Um, for cane sugar. The third reason was, I mentioned, the exploration of new territories in East Asia and in the East Indies. So new lands you were being brought into cultivation. And when you look at the size of some of the colonies in the West Indies, the Nevis and the St. Kitts and the Barbuda, um, it, they couldn't compare with um, some of the lands that were being opened up in East Asia. And the fact is that many of the lands in the Caribbean had been exhausted um, because some of them were being exploited since the 17th century. And we're now talking about the 19th century. So they had 200 years of, of uh, exploitation of limited land resources. So the opening up of these new lands made production of sugarcane, particularly by slaves, by enslaved labor, much less profitable than it had been before. And the fourth factor that I'd like to mention now was the influence of public opinion. Um, nowadays, you might want to call it, you know, um, civil society. Many people are very dismissive of civil society, but in Britain at that time, in the, towards the middle of the, of the 19th century, um, the franchise had started to change. So many more business types, many more middle class types were winning seats in parliament because of changes in the franchise. Um, this meant that public opinion was, was much more weighty. At the same time, there was particularly the end of the previous century what in European history is called the Enlightenment. 
and you remember the French Revolution, you remember um, the Declaration of the Rights of Man. This is an important contribution of the French Revolution to world history. And people took these rights seriously. And even now in Guyana, there is a charter of civil rights. In the Caribbean, there's a charter of, of civil rights. At this time, the rights of man became a major feature in, uh, in international relations. And together with the Enlightenment and also evangelism, and many of the new churches started to break away from Roman Catholicism and even Anglicanism. And many new denominations, like the Society of Friends and the Quakers, um, took the Bible literally, and they felt it was wrong to enslave other persons, that no human should enslave another human. So all of these ideas coalesced, they fused, and the general impact of public opinion was that uh, the slavery that we witnessed in the Caribbean and in the Guyana colonies was an abomination, it was an outrage. And they were not prepared to tolerate the enslavement of humans by humans as part of Christian civilization. So it is not simply um, the act of a few people on a plantation in the Guyana. As you can see, it was international. It dealt with the economy, it dealt with uh, enlightenment, it dealt with the exploitation of new territories, and it dealt with the impact of public opinion. So we mustn't feel that there was a, a monocausal uh, process. It was, you know, um, a process that embodied or embraced many different um, factors and many different opinions. The emancipation movement followed a path over a long period of time. And we must look briefly at that path if we want to understand um, how it evolved. Um, again, I think it would be prudent for me to divide that part into four phases. They didn't happen all together simultaneously. They were sequential. They happened one after the other. And the first phase was the abolition of the transatlantic trade in captive Africans. And this occurred in 1807 um, because of the pressure of these factors that I mentioned just now, the pressure of the evangelists. And we mustn't ignore that because around the same time, uh, in fact, I think 1808, the first um, uh, missionary associated with the Congregational Church um, came to um, what was then um, uh, Demerara. And uh, what we now know is the Congregational Church succeeded after that LMS the London Missionary Society, which is one of the group of evangelical churches. So it's very significant that the uh, abolition of the trade occurred in 1807. And as you know, Guyana and the Commonwealth celebrated that abolition in 2007, um, 16 years ago. Um, so the abolition of the transatlantic trade meant that the British government prohibited British ships, and at that time, Britain had the most powerful navy in the world, prohibited British ships from carrying captives or from taking captives from Africa and transporting them into any other British colony. Um, this is from March 1807. And thereafter, they started to prevent, because of their strength on the oceans, they started to prevent ships from other countries American, Portuguese, Brazilian, Spanish, Dutch, from moving captives. So the abolition of the trade um, summed the death knell of um, the, 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 you know, slavery, uh, transatlantic slavery. So what had been legal for 300 years was suddenly brought to an end. Uh, the next stage or the next phase was the amelioration of the conditions under which the enslaved Africans worked. And the British government recommended, and this is an important word, recommended an amelioration plan to the planters. They didn't enforce it, 
But as you know, what happens in a plantation, what happens in a household, what happens in the yards, uh, the enslaved Africans got to hear, uh, and they heard news wrong, that is why you must be careful about oral testimonies. Uh, they, they thought that the British king, the English king, had granted them freedom. In fact, what the amelioration was about was a reduction in the punishment. Uh, and this took place in May 1823. It limited field work. It reduced the number of lashes you can get, the corporal punishment. It prohibited the flogging of women because up to that time, women could still be flogged naked in the fields. And it permitted enslaved Africans to marry. And also it prevented the breaking up of, of African families by sale because up to that time, uh, a, a, a woman's daughter or son could be taken away and sent to another um, plantation sold to another plantation because the people were regarded as uh, two-legged domestic animals and they were the property of the, the white plantation owners. Um, so what happened in 1823 was that you couldn't break up families anymore and for the first time uh, enslaved Africans were permitted to marry and they were permitted to own property so they could own pigs and you know and um, poultry, and also they were permitted to give evidence in court. So it was a, a plan to make the conditions better. It wasn't freedom. And that is what happened in 1823. But when the Africans heard about the plan, they thought they were being given freedom, but the masters were preventing the kings um, order from being put into effect. And that was one of the major causes of the 1823 revolt. And um, that is why so many of them were killed um, at a Bachelor's Adventure. The next stage was the legal emancipation of Africans. And this occurred 10 years after the 1823 revolt. Obviously, the 1823 revolt in Demerara had an impact because of the factors I mentioned a little while ago. And after they felt that the, the missionary John Smith had been killed, after they heard about the massacre of Africans in Guyana, and of course there were other revolts, particularly in, in Jamaica, um, they uh, just uh, felt that it was time to bring the whole system of slavery to an end. And so an act was passed in the British Parliament in 1833, 10 years after the Demerari vote. You can see the connection there. And um, it was meant to be put in effect, not immediately, but the following year, 1834. And bear in mind that the Portuguese from Madeira started to write the very next year, 1835. But that's another, we'll come to that. So rather than granting the Africans freedom in 1834, they introduced simultaneously what is called the apprenticeship scheme, which meant that the Africans, far from being free, were being treated as apprentices. And they had to spend, it was assumed, um, a longer period learning to be free. Well, um, this was incomprehensible because it meant that um, from the 2nd of August, 1834, they had to go back on the same plant. They had to remain on the same plantation, work for the same master for 45 hours a week. So you can imagine that they had very little time for themselves. And that was meant to go on up to 1840. And the domestic laborers, uh, the household um, laborers, were meant to work for 30 hours a week. Of course, this caused a lot of uh, well, confusion and consternation when people realized that actually nothing changed on the 1st of August 1834. And that is why in Guyana, we don't recognize the 1st of August 1834 as Emancipation Day. So what happened is that because of the unrest, 
which was caused by the, what is called bogus emancipation of 1st of August, 1834, fake emancipation. Um, the British planters recognized that they were not getting the same amount of work out of the so-called apprentices. And um, the punishment continued and the resentment uh, grew and they decided to cut short this period of apprenticeship um, and liberate all Africans from the 1st of August, 1834. Whether they were predial workers in the field or domestic workers in the households, uh, or they were artisans, all of them were given free, everyone was given freedom from the 1st of August, 1838, and that is what we recognize in Guyana. You can see, therefore, that emancipation is important. It's, it may be a bit tedious to some of you to understand what happened over a long period of history, what happened in, the, in Europe and in, in the national world, but it is necessary to explain it so we can understand why it is important that we should celebrate emancipation in Guyana. It's not a one-day event, it's not a, a soiree, it is not a, a single festival. It took place over a very long people time and hundreds of people, thousands of people were killed in the process. What therefore were the consequences of, of this emancipation movement? Uh, first of all, there was demographic change and because people particularly the white planter class which the historians call the plantocracy but the planters felt that the africans would leave the plantations if they were granted freedom they started to look around the world for indentured immigrants and some indentured immigrants were brought from madeira not from the mainland portugal they were brought from Madeira. In fact, they, what we call, the people we call Portuguese in Ghana are mostly descendants of um, Madeira, um, of Portuguese um, ancestry, of course, but they were from Madeira. Now, this started since 1835, a good three years before Africans got emancipation. Of course, the Africans didn't walk off the plantation. Um, as uh, the planters expected. And in, in fact, the Portuguese were the first people to walk off the plantation um, after their indentures expired. Uh, so there was a big myth. And sadly, many Guyanese still believe that um, from emancipation, Africans just walked away from the plantation. No, by and large, they continued to work in the plantations. But Immigrants were brought in, first from Madeira, and then from May 1838. May, not August, May 1838, East Indians started to arrive. So you can see immigration started because of emancipation, prior to emancipation, very important. Later on, over the next 80 years or so, over 340,000 immigrants came into this country. Some from, um, from, some were from Asia, China, for example, uh, and India. Some from, some were from West Africa and some from the West Indies. So over the next 80 years, you had Chinese coming in, East Indians coming in, Africans coming in, West Indians coming in, and um, Europeans, you got the Portuguese are Europeans. The Portuguese are, are not Africans or, or Asians, they're Europeans. And all of these people came into Guyana to create this beautiful society we have, um, uh, this ethnic tapestry of Guyanese society. So the demographic change was an important consequence of emancipation. Um, and it wouldn't have happened without em emancipation. The second major change was the economic diversification, which was necessitated by emancipation because under the system of enslavement, um, you know, <laughs> of course the slaves weren't paid and you didn't need coinage in that um, amount, in that quantity. But those days, coins were made of valuable metal. You know, a shilling or a gilda was made of real silver. In fact, up to the Second World War, coins were made out of real silver. And 
many of the older ones listening to this program will know that uh, cents and pennies were made of real copper. Uh, and of course, the, the value of the copper is greater than the value of the coin. But it meant that from the time of emancipation, coins had to be introduced to facilitate trade. Um, because before that, there was just barter on, on, on uh, the village markets. People would exchange, you know, this amount of um, poultry for that amount of, of pigs uh, and so on. Um, banks were open for the first time to garner savings. And you must bear in mind that the people who were compensated um, at the time of emancipation were the planters. The Africans who had suffered enslavement were left with nothing. But the planters were given thousands of pounds of compensation. And this is one of the reasons why many, many Guyanese and West Indians are now arguing for reparations because our four parents never got compensation. But coming back to the issue is that banks were open to garner this huge amount of money that Britain gave to the white planters. Um, in addition to that, the, the former enslaved Africans started to become peasants and they cultivated crops. Um, they opened their own farms and some of these crops eventually were exported to the Caribbean um, by schooner, particularly to Trinidad and Barbados. Um, so there were new, new crops being cultivated. The education system came to be established. And again, we must thank the Congregational Church for being pioneers in, in a form of denominational um, education. They opened the first schools and um, some of the first teachers were former enslaved Africans, people who had learned to read and the first book they read was, was the Bible. Um, so we had these, these stirrings of uh, elementary or primary education system. And then, <laughs> <laughs> Very important from the point of view of law and order. Um, again, those of you listening must pay attention to the police anniversary. Every year, the police celebrate the anniversary in July. The police was forces established in 1839, less than a year after emancipation. So you can see um, how the British were thinking. Um, they established a police force to deal with the free uh, the free INAs. And this happened in less than a year after emancipation. So the governmental administration started to take shape because of emancipation. So we had a police service and there was some sort of prison. And not very long after that, the Esquivel Boys School was established. Um, so you can see law and order was meant to, um, to enforce um, discipline you can call it that, among the, the freed population. And of course, later on, the Chinese, East Indian, Portuguese had, had come into the country. And uh, when you read Guyanese history, you realize that law and order wasn't enforced only among Africa. But I think there was need for law and order among all of the ethnic groups. The third major change brought about by emancipation was geographic. Before emancipation, the coast of Guyana was just a string of plantations. And after emancipation, we started to see a change in the landscape. Free families who had hoarded their, their money um, during the period of apprenticeship, particularly, when coinage started to be introduced, were able to buy the, the plantations which are going out of business, particularly cotton plantations, because at that time, the American cotton production had started to pick up and Guyanese cotton was just wiped out of the market. And the Great Village Movement, which started in 1839, um, meant that new villages were being established, particularly um, the big six, you know, Buxton, Friendship, Bagotsville, Better for Wacting. You know, these big villages, Pleasance and, and Victorian, these big villages uh, transformed Guyana from a string of plantations to free villages. And you had populations of free persons who could build churches, build schools, and pursue their own economic interests without 
having to obey Massa. And this was an important geographic transformation of the landscape. So you had a demographic transformation, the economic transformation, and the geographic transformation. And there was also greater um, socio-political interaction, if I can call it that, um, because the ethnic groups now in the country started to interact. Um, and there were differentiations, naturally, based on ethnic origin, based on political belief, based on social class, based on religious beliefs. For example, when the Madeirans came, they um, adhered to the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, many of the Africans, uh, soon after emancipation, uh, adhered to the Congregational Church. Uh, when the Indians started to come, some of them were Hindus, some of them were Muslims. Um, so they were all forms of social interactions. And then you had interaction with, with the government and the formation of what I would call, or the foundation of what I would call the you know, village administration, local government administration, as we know it now in 2023. So I would stop here. Um, it, it was a, a, a very important phase or stage of Guyanese history. Um, what we call the emancipation movement over this 200 year period. Uh, we can bring it to an end roughly in 1838, but of course, um, in future discussions, we look at other aspects of uh, emancipation. But what I would say now in 2023 is that emancipation is the single, the single most significant event in our nation's history. It is not just for Africans. It's not a black people festival. It is a national festival. It ended 200 years of enslavement. Um, um, 185 years ago in 1838, it formed the foundation for the freedoms which Guyanese enjoy today. It shaped the demography, the economy, the geography, and the sociology of our nation. And it started the process, it started the process which enabled future generations to enjoy those liberties for which they fought. It enabled future generations to um, enjoy a good life. And that is what um, emancipation means to all of us and enable future generations to enjoy the good, good life. Thank you and God bless you all. Man, man.